There are three leading emphases which may be mentioned by way of introduction. First, the emphasis that the universe had a beginning, it is not eternal. The data enunciated in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, are basic to all Christian thought of God, of reality distinct from God, and of God's relation to that reality. And second, the second leading emphasis is that in the production of the heavens and the earth, there was orderly progression. They did not come to be by one all-embracing fiat. There is process, and that process is characterized by ordered sequence moving to its climax in the formation of man as the crown of God's handiwork. And the platform of life for man was prepared by successive steps of divine action, and life itself appeared to an appreciable extent in an ascending scale until it reached its apex in man. Then third, at each stage in this progression, God spoke. He gave command. There is no grand fiat by which created reality was endowed with potencies which spontaneously produced, for example, the various forms of life. We read repeatedly, nine times in the first chapter of Genesis, and God said, and uh, that is very significant because the cosmogony of Genesis 1 and also of Genesis 2 is expressly anti-deistic. We are advised also of the significance of the word of God and of the efficacy belonging to it. Now when we come to the origin of man, we meet a very striking difference. The terms of introduction, Genesis 1.26, have no parallel elsewhere. And all the features point up eloquently the distinctiveness of man's origin not simply the distinctiveness of man, but the distinctiveness of his very origin. There are various distinctive features, and I'm going to mention them as the main uh, divisions under capital Roman 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5. And first of all, we have the distinctiveness arising from the unique engagement of God's counsel. Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us make man. The distinctiveness, of course, resides not in the fact that God spoke, but in what he did on this occasion speak, namely, let us make. The formula is not that of simple fiat, as in the case of light, let there be light, and there was light, nor is it that of command in reference to existing entities, as in various other instances. Let the earth bring forth tender herb. Let the water swarm, swarm of living creature. Let the earth bring forth living creature. The form that we have in Genesis 1.26, let us make, indicates that there is unique engagement of divine thought and counsel. And this formula bespeaks the fact that something correspondingly unique 
is about to be accomplished. It, it, of itself, it implies the elevation of man over all the other creatures. There is, we could say properly, distinguishing character in the product because there is distinguishing preoccupation with the event. In no aspect of his origin is man on a parity with the other creatures, not even with the highest of the animate beings of his environment. The distinctiveness, in other words, appears in the counsel of which man's origin is the effect. Now, second, the capital Roman II, the distinctiveness arising from the nature with which man is endowed. Distinctiveness arising from the nature with which man is endowed. The sequence in which Genesis 1.26 occurs draws this to our attention very strikingly. Other creatures animate and inanimate were made after their kind. And in Genesis 1, verses 24 and 25, you have an eloquent reiteration of that fact. To his kind occurs on five occasions in these two verses, which immediately precede Genesis 1.26. And then in verse 26, you have this abrupt change from the formula to its kind to in our image according to our likeness. And that abrupt change points up the difference between the pattern to which other forms of life conform and the exemplar which is the model for man. In the one case, the pattern uh, to uh, uh, the pattern to which other forms of life conform, there is indeed, of course, the pattern, and that pattern is devised by God and established by God, and of course, in that respect, it bears the imprint of God's own wisdom, as well as the imprint of his goodness and power. But the language in these instances is very far from suggesting any heavenly exemplar. There is indeed the pattern, kind, whatever that may mean, kind, but there is no heavenly exemplar. And so to its kind, or according to its kind, suggests nothing more than a fixed pattern in accordance with God's determination. But in the case of man, there is more than this divine will and determination. The pattern that is devised and determined by God in the case of man is the exemplar provided by the nature of God himself. God determined that that should be the case, but the pattern is the exemplar that was not willed to be. And observe the distinction. The exemplar was not a pattern that was willed to be. It is that which belongs to God himself, intrinsically and essentially, namely, his own character. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. So man's origin is not only the unique subject of the divine counsel. Man is the recipient of unique endowment and blessing.
And of course, as we shall see later on, this is really the definition of man. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Just as the kind would indicate the classification uh, to which uh, other beings belong, and in that respect indicate the definition, so in the case of man, in our image, according to our likeness, is the definition of his very specific character. Then third, capital Roman three, we have the distinctiveness arising from the lordship with which man was invested. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the heaven, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Still Genesis 1:26. Now man's creation as the last in the series is no doubt correlative with this lordship. It is appropriate, you see, that the denotative reference should be apparent in the investiture. But the prerogative of dominion rests not on the sequence but on the nature with which man was endowed. He is in the image of God. So he is God's vicegerent because he is like God. Now for capital Roman 4, we have the distinctiveness of God's procedure in the formation of man. The distinctiveness of the procedure in the formation of man, and here we turn to Genesis 2-7. A word, of course, uh, by way of introduction to this, is necessary in connection with the difference between Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, and Genesis 2, 4 through 25. It is unfortunate, I think, that the divisions of chapters have had come as it is, that we may call, for convenience sake, the difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. But Genesis 2 is Genesis 2, 4 through 25. There are differences between these two chapters. In the former chapter, in the former passage, man is set forth in his place in the creative process as a whole and in his relation to the creation as a whole. The panorama, therefore, is very inclusive. In Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. But in Genesis 2, 4 through 25, we have a more detailed account of the mode of God's activity in forming both the man and the woman and a more detailed account of their immediate relations and environment. And I submit that that is the purpose, that that is the principle of interpretation that should be applied to these two chapters. Now, Genesis 2, 7, occurring in what we may call for general purposes, chapter 2, is consonant with that general purpose and with that principle of construction. It is concerned with the origin of Adam as distinct from Eve. And uh, that should be borne in mind that Genesis 2, 7 is not simply concerned with the origin of mankind, but it is concerned with the origin of Adam himself, as distinct from Eve. And the Lord God formed the man, dust from the ground, and breathed in his nostrils breath of life, 
and man became living creature. Now that translation, I think, is is uh, warranted and even necessary in the interests of proper exegesis. I read it again. And the Lord God formed the man, dust from the ground, and breathed in his nostrils breath of life, and man became living creature. Now, this requires more detailed examination than the other four, than the other three distinctive features which I gave at the beginning. And consequently, in dealing with this distinctive feature and with Genesis 2 7, it uh, is necessary to take account of the various elements within it. And the first element I mention is under capital A, formation. And the Lord God formed the man. Formation. Material substance previously created by God and called in this verse dust from the ground entered into the composition of man's being. So when man was made in accordance with the resolution and design of Genesis 1.26, it was not by simple fiat, by what has been called creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing, which is a very unfortunate formula, but nevertheless is the traditional formula. It was not by creatio ex nihilo that man was formed. The word of God contemplating and effecting man's origin terminated upon existing matter. And this existing matter or substance was subjected to formative action on God's part. That is prior to any further action. Dust from the ground enters into man's constitution from the very outset. It is not an appendage. It is not an accident. And that is very eloquently certified later in Genesis 3.19 when we read, Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. We very glibly quote this and perhaps quote it in connection with funerals, but uh, we far too frequently overlook dust thou art. This is not dust. Not dust to dust, earth to earth, ashes to ashes. That's an utterly pagan formula, and it exasperates me to hear it at funerals. Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. So there are certain corollaries arising in, from this, this uh, principle of formation. Arabic 1. Man has affinity with his non-animate environment, with the ground which supports him and from which he derives to a large extent his physical sustenance which it is his task, of course, to till and dress and subdue. He has affinity. There is, therefore, congruity between man and his environment. And necessarily so. If man were wholly diverse, there would be a discrepancy between man and his habitat, and a discrepancy between man and his task, a discrepancy incompatible with what is implied in the divine verdict spoken of in Genesis 1:31. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, second, a second observation in connection with this principle of formation. Man has affinity with other animate beings which inhabit the earth with him. Here it is necessary to take a note of the similarity that there is between Genesis 2, 7, 
and Genesis 2.19. Genesis 2.7, of course, as I quoted already, reads, And the Lord God formed the man, dust from the ground, and breathed in his nostrils breath of life, and man became living creature. And then Genesis 2.19 reads, And the Lord God formed from the ground every beast of the field and every fowl of the heaven. So you see, when these two are coordinated, we find there is an affinity in respect of constitutive element and formative action. An affinity between man and his animate environment in respect of constitutive element and formative action, even though there may be a very important difference in the distinction between the ground, Genesis 2.19, and dust from the ground, Genesis 2.7. So we fail to take account of man's affinity with his environment if we overlook the data which so eloquently point to this affinity, obviously intimated in a comparison of Genesis 2.7 and Genesis 2.19. Then a third principle in connection with this uh, aspect of formation, the differences have also to be taken into account. Genesis 2.19 must be coordinated with Genesis 1, verses 24 and 25. And Genesis 2.7 must be coordinated with Genesis 1.26. In Genesis 1.24 and 25, as also in Genesis 1.20, the thought is permissible that there were potencies deposited by God in the earth and the waters that were to put forth their energies at God's behest. In Genesis 2-7, the case is wholly different. And nowhere is there a formula after the pattern of Genesis 1, 20, 24, and 25, such as we might think of let dust bring, or let dust from the ground bring forth man. So you need but to repeat the various formulae. The formulae that you have in Genesis 1, verses 20, 24, and 25, and then the formula that we have in Genesis 1, 26 to detect the difference in Gen Genesis 1, 26 and Genesis 2, 7. In Genesis 2, 7, there is much more intimacy of relation consonant with Genesis 1, 26. Now, under this fourth main subdivision, the next principle, the next uh, observation, main observation I'm going to make, capital B, is concerned with impartation. In Genesis 2, 7, you first of all have formation and the various implications of that. Now, capital B, you have impartation. And this concerns the second part of Genesis 2, 7. And breathed in his nostrils breath of life, and man became living creature. Living creature. There are in this connection several observations. Arabic 1. In breathing, and breathed in his nostrils breath of life. That in the Hebrew is a, a very striking expression. Uh, 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 don't have my Hebrew Bible here, and the first word has escaped me. Uh, 
No, it's not Ruach. Is it Ruach Hayim? Mr. Thomas, Mr. Jeffrey Thomas, do you remember? Uh, it's funny how that I was quoting it all morning, and here it has gone from me. A breath of life, uh, Nishmas, yes. Nishmas Hayim. Nishmas Hayim. That's a rather striking expression because you have the dual or the plural in Chayim, and literally it be, as it were, breath of lives, but it's pedantic to translate it that way. The plural in Hebrew is often used for a singular in order to express the fullness of the idea, like, of course, uh, the word Mayim is a dual for water and shouldn't always be translated as a plural. But that's a striking expression, breath of life, because it expresses the fullness of the life that had been communicated. Now, this represents communication from without and cannot be interpreted as evolution of potencies resident in dust from the ground. Cannot be. It's impartation, communication. Nor can it be interpreted even in terms of potencies belonging to the resultant of the formative action to which dust from the ground had been subjected. It cannot be interpreted in terms of evolution of potencies in any way whatsoever. We do not know, of course, the precise nature of the action denoted by in-breathing. No doubt there is something pictorial about that. But it must stand for interposition by which the breath of life was communicated. That is, interposition by which animation was imparted to that which is called dust from the ground. That is to say it was by special action on God's part that life was communicated. And exegetically, I don't believe we can just get around that. Whatever in breathing may be, it is communication, impartation, special action on the part of God. Then the second observation respecting this impartation concerns the expression I translated living creature. Now you can call it living soul if you will because the term there is nephesh which means soul. You can call it living soul but I render it for exegetical reasons now living creature, living creature. Now, well, that means simply animate being, creature with a breath of life. The expression is itself generic and is applied to other animate beings. Genesis 1, verses 21, 24, and 30. It is simply a complete departure from the regulative principle of uh, interpretation to lay particular emphasis upon the word soul in this verse as if that word itself indicated a distinctiveness of itself. It is significant that it is a generic term that is used in this instance, a term that is e equally applied to other animate beings in the preceding chapter. For it means that it was by this act of impartation that the entity came to belong to the category of animate being. Man did not become animate by any process short of that action denoted by in-breathing. If man were previously animate and required the in-breathing 
to constitute him specifically man as distinct from some lower form of animate life, then it could not be said that by the inbreathing he became living creature. In other words, the inbreathing was not an action that was interposed upon an already existing animate being. I'm simply exegeting this passage, and that is the obvious implication of the construction. Now a third observation respecting this principle of impartation concerns the expression man became living creature. It was the inbreathing that constituted this being specifically man. Genesis 2-7 does not refer to the origin of any supposed animal progenitor of man. And that follows for several reasons. First, the definition of man is already provided by Genesis 1.26. And consequently, in Genesis 2.7, we cannot have any other concept in view when we read, and the Lord God formed the man. It is the formation of man measuring up to the character and status of Genesis 1.26 that is in view in Genesis 2-7, and not some animate progenitor of man, not savage man, but man whose denotation and connotation are determined for us by the preceding context, especially Genesis 1-26. And then second, any lower form of animate life would be incompatible with the role accorded to man in the context of Genesis 2-7, not to speak of Genesis 1-26. It would be incompatible with the role that is accorded to man in this context, namely in Genesis 2, verses 4 through 25. The man of Genesis 2-7 is the man to whom God speaks, the man who receives commandments, the man who finds no counterpart in lower creation. So it would be exegetical violence to introduce a concept of man at this point, alien to every note found in the immediate context. So, you see, you have this summation of uh, considerations elicited from Genesis 2-7. First, it is the divine in-breathing that constituted man animated.